My name is Eliza Borne, and I'm the editor of the Oxford American Magazine. Tonight, I am thrilled to welcome Silas House to Little Rock to discuss his novel, Southernmost. Southernmost begins when a Pentecostal preacher is moved to extend hospitality to a gay couple after a catastrophic flood. The preacher's community is not inclined to be so tolerant, and his decision has cascading effects. This is a gripping and timely novel, as the characters grapple with complex themes like faith and fear, tolerance and judgment, love and parenthood. Southernmost was published last June, and by now it has been widely recognized for its excellence, including being longlisted for the Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Fiction and showing up on many best book of the year lists. This is no surprise, because in addition to being a good old-fashioned storyteller, Silas is a beautifully descriptive and sensory writer. I learned this firsthand in 2017 when he wrote an essay about the Phipps family for the Oxford American's Kentucky Music Issue. When I accepted Silas's piece, I knew that he was one of our great Southern writers. After I was lucky enough to work with him, I learned that he is also one of our kindest. Aside from the OA, Silas's writing frequently appears in national publications like The Atlantic, where just a couple of days ago, he published a piece about flooding in central Appalachia. He is the best-selling author of six novels, as well as three plays and a book of creative nonfiction, Something's Rising, co-authored with fellow OA contributor and anti-mountaintop removal activist Jason Howard. I have several sponsors to thank for making this evening possible. Our presenting sponsor is the UCA College of Fine Arts and Communications, where Silas visited today for a workshop with students. Southwards is presented in partnership with the Central Arkansas Library System's Six Bridges Book Festival. The book festival announced the 2020 lineup a couple of weeks ago, and I encourage you all to check out the roster. We'll have about 60 authors in town April 23rd through 26th. Additional season partners include UAMS College of Medicine's Department of Medical, Humanities, and Bioethics, the Clinton School of Public Service, Arkansas Arts Council, the Department of Arkansas Heritage, and Villa View at Soma. Thank you all. We're now, yeah. Every time we bring a new author in for Southwards, they marvel at our library system in this space and how special all of this is, and we couldn't do it without our sponsors. We're now halfway through our first season of Southwards. Silas's fellow Kentuckian, Lisa Cross-Smith, will be here in conversation with Kevin Brockmeyer on March 31st. And yesterday we announced a special addition to the series. Beth Macy, the best-selling author of Dope Sick about the opioid crisis, will be here on May 19th. Please save the dates and come. Finally, if you appreciate events like this one, please consider supporting the Oxford American. You can do that today in the lobby by buying an OA subscription, or making a tax-deductible donation, or by buying a copy of the magazine. We just unveiled our Spring 2020 issues cover this afternoon. The issue is not on sale until next month officially, but you can take home a copy tonight. You can also listen to our podcast, Point South. This evening's conversation is being recorded for a segment on a future episode, so if you ask a question during the audience Q&A, please know that you are giving your consent to have your voice appear on our podcast. Um, when it's time for questions, line up in the aisles. Um, and after the event, I hope you will all stay and buy a copy of Southernmost, which Silas would be happy to sign. So let's give Silas a warm welcome to Little Rock. Hello, thank you all so much for being here. We should have had pancakes for everybody tonight again. Uh, I would have enjoyed that. Um, and we will get you out of here in time to, for the debate. Um, I'm so proud to be part of this series. Oxford American is, uh, you know, we're so lucky to have this magazine. It makes such a difference in uh, Southern literature and national literature. So. published in Oxford American a couple of times, and it's such a pleasure to work with Eliza, especially. Um, and I'm also thankful to all the partners who are involved and everybody who uh, is a literary citizen and, and makes events like this possible and comes out for events like this. I think it's uh, so important in dark days uh, to hold up the arts 
And if we don't do it, nobody else is going to, I'm afraid. And so uh, thank you all for, for supporting the arts and uh, being a part of that. Um, it really means the world to me and right. I'm just going to read about 10 minutes or so uh, because I want plenty of time to, to be able to talk to Seth and to be able to talk to y'all. So I hope you'll have some questions. We can have a conversation. Um, but I want to tell you a little bit about Southernmost, my most recent novel. Um, it begins um, on a June day in 2015 when a devastating flood hits the small community of Cumberland Valley, Tennessee, right outside of Nashville. Um, the flood happens to coincide with um, the Supreme Court's ruling on marriage equality. And so some people in the community begin to blame the flood on, on the Supreme Court decision, as, as we have heard uh, televangelists do before. Um, <clears throat> and so at the, this sets some things into motion for the main character, Asher Sharp, who's a 35-year-old uh, evangelical preacher. Um, who 10 years before badly rejected his brother, Luke, when he came out to him. And Luke disappeared, and he hasn't heard from him since. And so over those 10 years, Asher has done a lot of self-examination. He's uh, been educating himself in, in lots of ways, and he's really questioning if he really believes what he's saying from the pulpit, and if he really believes everything he's been taught all of his life. Um, and so for me, Asher is sort of a every American, and I think that over the last uh, 30 years or so, so many people have really evolved on this issue and began to think about it in a, in a different way and do a lot of self-examination and self-questioning in that way. And so the night the flood happens, a, a gay couple who lived down the road from him come to his house seeking shelter. Their house has been washed away in the flood. And his wife uh, turns them away. She refuses them shelter. She says that she can't have them stay at her house in front of their child. Um, and this is a breaking point for Asher. Uh, their marriage has been in trouble for a while, but this is the point where he can no longer be quiet. And, and so he articulates that to her. Around the same time, the, uh, the gay couple began to come to the church where he's pastor, and the congregation uh, wants to turn them away. And again, Asher just can no longer be quiet. And so he stands up and makes an impassioned plea for acceptance in the church, and the congregation promptly fires him. And one thing leads to another. Um, before you know it, he has no job. He, his, uh, he's divorced. And his wife has gotten custody, full custody of their child uh, due to a, a judge who uh, objects to uh, the way Asher has handled all this and, and uh, is one of the people who has voiced opinions against the gay marriage decision. So, feeling as if that decision is totally unjust, Asher uh, kidnaps his nine-year-old son, Justin, and the uh, takes him off to Key West. And so the rest of the book is set Key West where he sort of uh, creates a family for himself and, and tries to find his brother. He thinks he has gone to Key West. So, so for me, the book um, it all comes back to parenthood. Um, I, I was writing the book when both of my children were about to go away to college and I finally felt like I had learned enough about parenthood to to write about that to some degree, although anybody who's a parent knows that you never really know anything. You know, you're just, uh, if you're on the whim the whole time, you're trying to do your best, right? And um, so for me, it's about this man who wants desperately to protect his child, and he makes bad decisions in doing that. And he also has his whole life long to have parents um, who, who give him the proper acceptance and who would give his brother the proper acceptance. Um, so those are some of the issues going on. Um, and it's also a lot about doubt and belief and the way that uh, those things are really complicated, but often they're made into something that's really cut and dry and simple. And I, I mean, they are probably the most complicated things of all. Um, and so in this scene, Asher has been driving for several hours after he's kidnapped his little boy. 
and um, that they stop for him to rest for a little bit. So I'll read this to you and I'll tell you a little bit more about it. Asher sat by the window watching the trees. There were thirsty looking pines and short little palm trees and the parking lot blacktop was covered with a thin layer of sand that had blown in sometime when there was actually a breeze. The trees were completely still in a way they never were back home in Tennessee. He didn't see a single bird. Maybe they were way back in the deepest parts of the woods where the pine shade was cool and fragrant, a better place for winged things than out by the treeless interstate where it was nothing but rotting motels and truck stops. They were in a motel near the Florida-Georgia border. Asher had driven more than eight hours before he started falling asleep. He had coasted into the Shady Oaks Motel, got in a room, and had dived into a hard sleep after making Justin swear to not leave. He had fallen asleep to the sound of his son watching TV, but now was awake after only a couple of hours. Justin's small snores were singing across the room to him. At least the room had offered those two hours of sleep. There was a rust stain on the floor and the toilet and the bar of soap was thin as a Hershey bar and smelled like funeral flowers. The towels were like sandpaper. Justin had said the remote felt sticky. It's perfect that the word shady is in this motel's name, Justin had said. Asher had clicked off the television and now he sat on the air conditioner at the window. An old dog moseyed across the parking lot. If he were a dog, he thought he'd be crawling up under a cool porch somewhere, getting off that hot black top. There was something pitiful about the dog, maybe because he was all alone out there. Asher reckoned he probably hadn't had a bath his entire life. He was black and white, but everything about him had been grayed by dust. The dog stopped and sniffed at the air. Maybe he was out hunting food, too hungry to be lounging around under a porch. And then he turned and set his eyes right on Asher's. Justin's snoring popped up like a bad muffler, and then he snorted and rolled over, his deep breaths hushed by the pillow. Asher looked back to the window and saw the dog's tongue had lulled out. It seemed to Asher that the dog was lost not lost in the sense he didn't know where he was, but that he had no idea what his next move might be. Asher padded into the bathroom and filled a thin plastic cup with water. He slipped out of the moldy room and onto the sidewalk where a dozen air conditioners leaked thin streams that ran in jagged lines down the concrete. The heat was thick as curtains. Night was fixing to slide over the world and the cicadas were calming down for the hush time between daylight and dark when crickets rosin their bows. That was what happened in the deepest parts of the pine woods. Out here by the motel, there was only the sound of 18 wheelers groaning down the interstate one after another, an endless noise of commerce. The dog lay on the narrow rectangle of grass between the sidewalk and the parking lot his back legs splayed out, his front paws tucked under his chest. Asher leaned over, trying to not spill the full cup of water, and put his hand out so the old boy could draw in his scent. The dog sniffed his fingers and latched his eyes onto Asher with a mixture of trust and suspicion. Hey there, buddy, Asher said. He set the cup on the sidewalk and the dog glanced up to make sure it was a gift, and then his tongue lashed at the water as if his full thirst had only now overtaken him. The whole time, his eyes were saying, thank you so much, that's the best damn water I've ever had in my whole damn life. <laughs> then the dog was going crazy, licking Asher's hand, jumping up so he could squat down and give his full attention. He smelled like he'd rolled around in something dead and rotten. Asher petted him anyway. The dog looked like Beagle, Pitbull, maybe some Mountain Feist. He had a strong chest and a noble head, a slender but muscular body, despite his obvious hunger. Asher patted down the dog's back and he could feel the pebbles under his skin that he knew were birdshot pellets. Asher sat down on the grass and let the dog cover him up with loving, regardless of how badly he stank. The dog climbed into his lap and licked at his face, perching one of his paws upon Asher's chest. 
And this is the first time Asher had been truly happy in a long while. Yes, sir, buddy, that's a good boy. Yes, him is, Asher sang song to him. And the dog seemed to talk back by the way he wiggled and licked Asher's hands and face when he could sneak in a kiss. Here he was, Asher Sharp, a fugitive, on the run from the law. He had taken his son, and he knew right then that there was no way he was leaving this good old boy behind. to um, purposely insert symbolism in a book. But when, when the novel is finished, uh, and I'm reading it for the 40th time, I, I tend to notice where some motifs and, and symbols have arisen on their own. Um, and one thing I noticed was that dogs throughout the book sort of uh, represent the divine, um, the absence of the divine or uh, the presence of the divine. So in the, in the beginning of the book, a dog is missing, is lost, and Asher's faith is also uh, lost, and he's trying to find it. And then here, uh, a dog is found, and so his uh, belief is starting to uh, manifest again. And so I really, that made so much sense to me, and it, it sort of, to me, is a testament of the power. That's the thing I love so much about writing is that so often I realize I'm not really even in control of it. If it's going well, it's just, uh, it's happening, and um, somehow it's getting onto the page. That made so much sense to me because I never feel more in the presence of, of goodness, like pure goodness, than when I'm with an animal. Um, for me, it's, it's dogs. It always has been. I've, there's never been a point in my life, in my memory, that I haven't had a dog. Um, and so I, I, I feel that presence of the divine very much with them. I think that I love that part of the book the most, so that's why I read that part. Um, but just uh, one more thing that I wanted you to know is I just I wanted to write a novel that dealt with this issue, but not hammer you over the head with the issue, but instead present a human story that allows the issue to be there between the lines, you know and that you as the reader can find on your own. Um, so really when I do a reading, I talk more about that, I think, than it actually is in the book. You know, that, that's something that is in the white spaces, I hope, more than, than it's spoken. Um, and that, those human stories are just uh, presenting that for you. And I wanted to write a book in which I looked at the spectrum of belief um, all the way um, from somebody who's just fanatical to the point of cruelty all the way to somebody who believes in, in just kindness and look at every point on that spectrum in between um, and, and just examine the issues of faith in that way. So um, I'm looking forward to talking to Seth and I'm looking forward to talking to y'all again. Thanks for being here. by Seth Pennington, the editor-in-chief of Little Rock's own Sibling Rivalry Press, which is a national treasure and a jewel in our city's literary community. Among the press's many honors, the American Library Association has frequently recognized sibling rivalry on its annual list of recommended LGBTQ reading. Seth is the author of Tertulia, which was a finalist for the Eric Hoffer Chapbook Award, and he is editor of Stonewall 50 which features 21 poets connected by Arkansas on queer life after the Stonewall riots. Along with his husband, Brian Borland, I'm proud to share that he has a stunning selection of poems in the Oxford American's new spring issue. Thank you for being here, Seth. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. All right, Silas. So, Southernmost is the first book of yours that really deals so fundamentally with faith. As much of its focus is on Asher, the preacher, the father in the story, much of this book is actually about his son and his interactions with God and what he calls the everything. So I'm curious, actually, about how you begin to talk about your own religious or spiritual background of your childhood and maybe how that kind of crosses over into this text. 
Well, I was raised in a very strict fundamentalist church. It was a holiness church. Um, mostly, that means that it's a totally independent church. You know, there's no umbrella conference or organization. Um, and the, the pastor of the church sort of has had complete control over our lives, you know. Um, for, for many years of my childhood, um, it was the kind of church where um, women had to wear long skirts and long hair, no makeup. Um, the men didn't have that many <laughs> regulations. So I don't know why that is, but um, <laughs> um, um, you know, you you weren't supposed to go to the movies or to a ball game or to a carnival or a, certainly not a dance. You know, things like that. However, my parents. Um, felt like that they could impose those own rules on themselves, but they sort of gave, they sort of at a certain age let me make my own decisions about things, you know, so I, I did go to the movies and carnivals and trick-or-treating and things like that with my wild aunt who lived right next door and sort of balanced out my life, you know. Um, for a long time, I only thought about the damage done to me and growing up that way, but now I can look back and I can recognize that it was damaging in some ways, but I can also see some of the beauty in it. I mean, it was such a, it, the paradox is it was such a loving community and they all loved me so much, but I knew if they knew who I really was, they wouldn't love me anymore, you know? And that is a really hard thing to live with. So when I was 16, the preacher finally said something that was just so, too, it was too much, and I got up and walked out of the church. Um, and, and I never went back to the Holiness Church. And so for many years, I was just sort of, uh, you know, uh, the woods was my church, and that was it. And I mean, to some degree, that's still true. But uh, eventually, I found a church that I felt was uh, accepting and totally recognized me as a full human being, so I'm Episcopalian. And that's a really important part of you know, who I am, it's uh, one facet of, of me that I count as really important. So I wanted to write about faith and how there are lots of different ways to be a person of faith. And I think more and more, I feel like that the word Christian or believer or person of faith keeps getting hijacked by one group of very vocal people who I feel highlight the worst aspects of that, you know, and so I wanted to explore some of that in the book, and I wanted to show how there are good people involved in every point on that spectrum, but, and that it's really complicated, and that I think a lot of times when we talk about faith, we, we really simplify it, um, and assume that because somebody says they're a believer or a non-believer that we know everything about them, you know, mm -hmm. so that's some of the things I was exploring, um, my favorite moment in the book is, I don't, I don't want to give too much away, but there's a moment when a, character, a gay character says, um, I think the moment that is most autobiographical for me, a gay character says, all of my life you all have told me I'm not worthy of God, but I always had this little fire in me that nobody ever could put out. And that's sort of, I really identify with that line more than anything. The whole book, to me, is going toward that line. And the book was always called Little Fire until Celeste Ng had the name of book, Little Fires Everywhere. <laughs> it became really popular, so so we had to change the title. But Southernmost works too. Yeah. Well, speaking of like the gay characters in the book, something else that I thought was kind of interesting was that these men that you present are just like every single other person in their community. They are a part of the community, they're a part of the culture. They're singer-songwriters, they live in the country, they have the same dialect. The only thing that's different about them is their sexuality, but it is just this firm line that gets crossed where nobody can deal with them whatsoever. And I wonder what it was like, what this decision was like, because a lot of times you might want to, you would identify with them more. And so why, why would you choose not to have this, the protagonist of your book, not be a gay man, you know? Well, the main reason for that is because I didn't want my gay characters to be, I think very often gay characters in literature are always in turmoil 
they're always in trouble and they're often miserable and tortured. And I didn't want my gay characters to be like that. I wanted my gay characters to be the way that I feel right now. You know, I feel, um, I feel content with every part of myself, um, including being a gay person. Um, and I didn't want them to be like invisible people or, or, or race people or, or miserable people. And that makes for a pretty boring lead character. Sure. Your lead character needs to be in trouble, you know? <laughs> and so Asher is the one who's really in trouble in this, in this book. I mean, I, that's just the way the book came to me is one thing. But another thing is I did make a conscious decision to do that because I just felt he was more interesting. And I wanted to tell the story of most most people I know are like Asher. I don't think most people are deeply homophobic, you know, the, to the point of wanting to actively uh, hem people in. Um, I think that most people I know that, that I grew up around, and to me, Asher is very much a, a pretty typical Southern man of his generation, right? And I, I thought a lot about men that age and that I knew, and I thought that most of them had lots of questions about all this and couldn't quite come to a place of comfort with it. You know, throughout the book, even after, I mean, it's not like the switch, the light switch is switched from off to on for Asher. It's much more complicated than that. Right, you know, even up in the latter parts of the book, he's like, can I really stand to see my brother hold a man's hand? You know, and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I, I just thought that was more interesting, and I thought it spoke more to most Americans' experience. And I wanted a wide, I wanted a lot of different kinds of people to read the book, and I especially wanted people to read the book who would be challenged by it. Yeah, I didn't want to preach to the choir, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes people who would be challenged by that book wouldn't buy a book, wouldn't read a book, wouldn't check it out of the library, or buy it if it's told if it's told from that point of view. Now I haven't said that that's not why it wasn't like a marketing decision for me. It, that's in retrospect that I have seen that I've been able to talk to so many people who I, I wouldn't have been able to talk to, I think. I mean lots of this book's used a lot in church groups, which I love. And you know, when I go sometimes to visit those church groups or I Scott with them, people are people will, you know, flat out tell you, you know, I don't totally agree with you and then I get to argue with them, you know, <laughs> or you know, have a conversation with them. In writing the book, it's my job as the writer to not my job as the writer, I felt, was to put lots of different kinds of reactions to LGBTQ issues in the book, and for me as the writer, to not judge any of them. Now that's hard to do, especially when people are being homophobic, and you're a gay writer, right? The characters, I mean. But it was my job to put them on the page, and mostly let the reader come to their own conclusions about that. I mean, as soon as somebody knows I'm a gay writer, they know what my stance is on all this, right? But I have to be in the point of view of the main character. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, I wanted to talk too, because talking about this whole ident identity, uh, especially masculinity and all that, uh, with Justin, uh, Lydia, his mother especially, refers to him over and over again as this tender-hearted boy. Um, anytime he witnesses anything in nature, or at home, anytime anybody struggles, you can just see it all over him. It eats him up inside. Um, and she worries about that and wants to kind of snuff it out. And, I, and there's the, it's that kind of queerness about him. And whether he's queer or not, is, it doesn't really matter, but it is that kind of queerness about him. Um, and she just wants to make more of a man out of him, whereas Asher does the complete opposite and kind of embraces that side of a son and maybe kind of em it helps him embrace that side within himself. Um, every community stigmatizes folks that are different. That's just going to be. That's just going to happen. Whether a boy's too soft or if it's depression, it's just it's just tied up in what we think. Um, but I was wondering what you thought about if the arts can change how people think about things, whether it is mental illness or if it's uh, our sexual identity or even things like activism, like what you've done with mountaintop coal mine, uh, coal mining. 
Like, what, what, what can the arts do for that? From my point of view, they can, you know, I think literature and the arts period have always, you know, been one of the real changing forces on those fronts. I mean, I grew up in a town, a very segregated town. I grew up in a sundown town. I don't know, is that a phrase? Uh, I grew up, uh, if you don't know, a sundown town is where African American people were actively told to not be there after dark, you know, and it was well known. It was even posted for a while on signs in the town. And the town I grew up in is, is a pretty well known sundown town. There's a, a, a long history there that's been well documented. It was only through literature that I could start to really understand racism. And I mean, it's books like The Color Purple, you know, or uh, Beloved, or uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, even, which is somewhat of a white fantasy. But you know what I mean? It's, it's still, it made me think about race in a way that I wouldn't have otherwise, especially that early. Um, and, and I mean, just like I said, I've had so many people come to my readings after reading the book. That's been the most rewarding part, and say, you know, this changed my, this changed the way I thought. This made me reach out to a family member that I hadn't talked to, you know, after that came out to me. I mean, in a in, in a way, that's why I wrote the book. Was hoping that that would happen. I mean, I always write a book just hoping to reach one person. Yeah, that's all you can really hope for. Uh, um, if if it changes one person, then I, then I feel justified. However, having said that, I also think that it's important for me as a writer to, my main goal must be the human story. I think that's what a piece of literature must be above all. It can't be a polemic. You know, a novel can't, doesn't work if it's a polemic, if, if people just feel preached to and battered. I think if I did that, I would end up being the preacher that I had as a child. You know, every time I left church, I just felt beaten to death. I don't want my readers to feel that way. You know, it's complicated. It is complicated. Um, let's see. Um, early on, Asher is struggling with prayer, and he struggles with it all throughout the book. And it's sometimes words just don't come to him at all. And then other times, it's like, it's just not the right place for it. Um, when the flood's destroying so much and their dog first goes missing, his wife, the first thing she does is go to prayer, and she wants him to pray with her. But you write, the way that Asher and Lydia thought of God and prayer and worship was so different now, it might as well have been a wide river between them. Lydia is this really hard woman, and she's hard to like, but she's, I don't know, maybe the most believable woman in the book, or character in the book to me, because it was just so much of my, my childhood, I think, is that, is that woman. Um, she justifies her homophobia with scripture. It's inarguable. Um, but she's also so capable of loving, like you were mentioning from your own childhood. So I was just wondering, A, what it was like for you to write a character that was so anti-you, and like, what did you learn from it? Uh, I don't know. I don't know that I learned from it, I just know that it was incredibly hard to write because I disagreed with her so much. However, I know so many people like her. The reason she's so hard to write is because the novelist's job is to make every character three-dimensional. Some people aren't three-dimensional. I mean, I don't mean that in an elitist way. There are just some people who are one-dimensional, especially on things like equality issues or they think that the Bible, if it's in the Bible, that's the end, that's it, and there's no more nuance to it, you know? And that's who she is. I mean, you can't have a conversation with somebody who just says, well, it's in the Bible, that's all there is to it, you know? And I, you're never gonna sway me. What's the point of even having that conversation, right? So I know lots of people like that. I grew up with a lot of people like that. But at the same time, even though I have been personally negated and um, treated badly by people like that, I have still seen what Brad Watson calls green shoots of kindness in their heart, you know? And so I had to reveal those parts of her too. And some people in the queer community got mad at me and you know, they, they would say, you made her too, um, 
made her too complex. And I'm like, well, human beings are complex. You know, I mean, even if I totally disagreed with their moral center, they're still complex people. I mean, I couldn't make her into a complete one-dimensional villain like you would find in Batman or something. You know what I mean? So that is, uh, it was really hard to pull off because um, on one hand, she has to be one-dimensional because to some degree she is, but she's also a human being. And I think ultimately, you know, I totally disagree with the way she parented when she would say, you can't cry because people will call you a sissy. But I also know people like her that I understand that from her point of view, she's thinking, I'm preparing him for the world. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do as a parent because it's not necessarily that she thinks he's a sissy, she, or that she even has a problem with him being a sissy, but she doesn't want the rest of the world to treat him badly. You know what I mean? Right. I mean, it took my parents about 10 years to be okay with my coming out for us to really come to a place where they can sit down and have supper with me and my husband and treat us actually like a couple and treat us like real human beings. In that 10 years, when I was so, you know, hurt all the time about the rejection, there, there was still a love I had for them and a love that I could feel from them. You know, and so I tried to get that across in the book. Um, so it's, it's a, a really complicated thing to do. And um, that's why you have to write a novel about it, right? I mean, that's why you have to spend eight years and 350 pages on it. It's not something I can write a piece, uh, an 800 word piece and, and articulate. Well, speaking of writing and speaking of prayer, Marilyn Robinson says that for her, writing has always felt like praying because of the intimacy of the act. And I wondered if that was something like you shared with her. Does it feel like praying to you? Yeah, uh, uh, Marilyn Robinson's work is one of the biggest um, in, uh, influences on, on this book in particular. You know, I love every novel by Marilyn Robinson, particularly Home and Lila and Gilead. Well, that's all of them. Home, Gilead, Lila, Housekeeping, that's all of them, right? Um, so they have tremendous influence on this book, and I'm thinking a lot about that particular phrase. Um. So also, music is huge with you, and I even went back and reread uh, Clay's Quilt, uh, which is really cool because Tyler Childers is going to be writing a new forward for a, a, re a new edition that's coming out. Yeah, that'll make all the kids read it, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm a kid, right? <laughs> um, but I was noticing in both books how you use music often to begin chapters. Um, you set the tone with music all the time, like people are, they're getting in their truck and they're, they're plugging in a song and, it, and it's indicative of the scene, but it's more than that too. Um, in Southernmost, Asher gets completely lost in music. He says he felt God in his fingers as he was playing, much the same as when Anna is playing her fiddle and plays quilt. Um, so I wondered, A, if you're a musician and if you talk about what the music is to you, uh, like its role in your life, and in your writing, I know you also do music journalism. Well, I think one of the main things is that I, it, the best thing about the Holiness Church is the music. I mean, it's it's sort of like rock and roll. I mean, there's always an electric guitar, there's always an electric bass, there's always drums, there's always a pounding piano. Also, all of that is usually played by women. It's the real role of power in the Holiness Church that women have is the music, you know. Um, so when I left the church, walked out of the church, when you've raised your whole life thinking everything is a sin, when you leave the church, you think, well, now I'm going to do it all, you know, <laughs> I'm going to go crazy. And so it was a huge surprise to me when I went back then, you know, a 16-year-old could sneak into a bar in a way they can't now. But the first time I went into a bar and thought, wow, this music is exactly like, <laughs> oh, this music, like Bob Seger sounds a lot like... Holiness music, you know, and things like that. But um, I just, I grew up in a place where, you know, it was very, it, every day music was so present. My mother's a pretty well known gospel singer in Eastern Kentucky, and so I would, you know, come into the living room and there'd be, you know, a bunch of women all singing and playing the piano. Um, then I'd go out on the porch and there'd be my uncle playing the banjo. You know, and then I'd go across the road to my cousin's house and she would have all of her records laid out and she'd be playing you know, whatever the big pop hits at the time were. And then I'd go in my aunt 
you know, would be, she, she loved, I mentioned Bob Seger, she would be playing Bob Seger, and she loved Prince, and um, ACDC, and, you know, stuff like that. So I just had, it was so eclectic, the music was. I was hearing it in every different way. And so I never go a day without listening to music, and the first thing that I do to create a character is figure out what music they love. Um, and so I knew right away that Asher, his favorite uh, artist is uh, Patty Griffin. And if you've heard her, I mean, it, it makes so much sense because there's so much longing in her music. Um, and the little boy is obsessed with My Morning Jacket, who on the surface sounds like this wild rock and roll band, but they're really talking about belief and doubt, you know, and these really profound <laughs> issues. Um, Joni Mitchell's a big part of this book. One of the main characters loves Joni Mitchell. Um, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. It just helps me to know the characters, and I think often it helps the reader to disappear into the book. When you mention a song, but Joni Mitchell, a lot of people will get that reference, and they can hear it. You know, they can hear blue being played. Yeah, on the and piano. you kind of know a person. Right. Yeah. Um, and I often write whole scenes situated around songs too. You know, like. I, every time I would sit down to write a scene, I would have a particular song I was listening to. So I think there's a real thin line between the reader and the writer, and some of that stuff comes through. I believe a lot in the psychology of writing, and that veil, that thin veil between. So if we pull it back just a little bit, this is like one of our favorite questions, Brian. And my husband and I ask uh, new authors to our press and everything when we're first kind of like interviewing them. Uh, so. In the soundtrack of your own life, what's track three? Not track one. <laughs> like where you can really say something. You're not just catching somebody's attention. It, well, I don't know if many people will get this reverence, but it, it would be No Hard Feelings by the Avid Brothers. All right, yeah. And that, it's a song that's a lot about some of the things I've been talking about. It's, you know, getting older and I'm 49 and just realizing that a lot of the stuff that for so many years I look back on as being damaged and that there's some good in that too, you know, and that forgiveness is such a powerful thing for the person doing the forgiving, you know. It's really, uh, we, we always think of forgiveness as a selfless act, but in many ways it's selfish. I mean, because it serves the self more than it serves anybody else, you know. Um, and so I think that comes up a lot in my work, the theme of forgiveness. Um, so yeah, No Hard Feelings by the Air Brothers, look it up, it's a great song. And by the way, uh, if you read Southernmost, uh, there's about 80 song soundtrack on Spotify, it's split into two, so if you just, if you, if you subscribe to Spotify, or even if you don't, you can use Spotify without a subscription. Um, just search for Southernmost, and there'll be one called Southernmost, one called More Southernmost, and it's all the music from the book. All of my books have soundtracks on Spotify. And then I had one other question for you. Um, so Marriage Equality passed in 2015, and this book takes place after that, of course. Um, that's one of those days, kind of like the moon landing or 9-11, where it's like everybody... Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> for everybody that you meet, though, you have your own story right. about where you right. were, what you yeah. were doing, how you felt. Like, I was here in Little Rock. My husband was off on a book tour in California, so, and like I felt every emotion all at once. Right. felt kind of hysterical yes. and was lucky to have some friends here. We like met up and kind of celebrated, cried at the same time. Yep. Um, but what was going on in your life, and how did that affect your family? I was on a family vacation, and um, my husband was not with me because at that time my parents still, you know, we. we I mean, it was cordial, but not enough for us to go on vacation together. Mm -hmm. And so as soon as the decision came down, I left. I left immediately and went to, to my husband and my children. Uh, we have two children. And um, so immediately there was a big gathering on the courthouse lawn in Lexington, Kentucky, um, the nearest big city where I lived at the time. And people literally danced in the streets. So it was, yeah, a, a really historic moment. Um, and I already had this book written when marriage equality happened, so I had to rewrite the book because it sort of antiquated the book <coughs> to some degree for it not to be in there. I had to acknowledge it, you know? And so then it made perfect sense 
that that would be an end, but that the flood would join in with the marriage equality, and people would blame it on the marriage equality decision, so it worked out perfectly. Well, that's interesting, because I, I actually thought the opposite, that it might have spurred it. No, thematically, it was all already there. It was just like I had to go back and insert the actual decision and things like that. I'll have to tell Brian he's in trouble because he didn't come home. <laughs> um, let's see. Let's see. I think that uh, we probably need to take a couple of questions from you guys to make sure you have a chance to ask what you want to ask. If anybody has any questions, just kind of raise your hand and we'll get somebody with a microphone. Or you can come up to these microphones. Does anybody have anything?
And also, I think for me, I think the South has always looked at it as the other, but the South is a mirror. You know, the rest of the country wants the South to be the best of us. We are the best of America in many ways. Like that was one thing the South is. Everybody's friendly and everybody, you know, have, helps each other out. We all know each other. Nobody locks their doors. It's, you know, it's all picket fences and all that. More nuclear families and everybody goes to church and all that. That's the way a lot of Americans want to think about the South. They also want to think about the South as illiterate and racist and homophobic and misogynist. And it's like they want to put all of the best on us and all the worst on us. So it's really a mirror more than it is the other. I think the South is a microcosm for America. So in some way, I think, I, for me, the title is saying, yeah, this is very much a story set in the South, but America's the South. It, you know, we're, we are uh, the mirror that is constantly being held up to the rest of America. And I, I think that's one thing, I think, when you read the novel, I, I think that comes through pretty clearly that, he, that, that it's an American story that is set in in the South pretty vividly, I hope. And of course, it's set, most of it's set in Key West, being the southernmost point. And it's so ironic that the southernmost point in the United States is one of the most open, you know, and embracing parts of America, um, even though people think of the South as not being open and embracing. Um, and I think, you know, all over the South, we see more and more but places where people are open and embracing. And so I want to just look at all those things, you know. Um, that was the main thing that I thought, thought it worked. Uh, good evening, Silas. Uh, I had a quick, quick craft question. Um, I wanted, I'm really curious about uh, third person POV and the distance that it allows. Um, the writer from the drama that's happening in the story. I wonder whether or not there was something that you found in that distance between you as a writer and the characters that you were presenting and sort of moving around the page that sort of allowed you to tell the story specifically. And I'm also curious about whether or not that gap allowed uh, breakthroughs in terms of using vernacular, because I feel like it's different using vernacular in a first person uh, point of view. So I was just curious what you thought, sir. Great question. Well, first of all, I write every novel that I write <clears throat> in two points of view. Like I will, every novel that I've written, if it ends up being published in first person, I have also written it in third person. Simultaneously? No, no, at different times. Um, you know, like I'll write the whole novel in first person, and then I'll immediately, it's sort of like a revision technique of mine, I'll immediately turn around and write it in third person and see which one works better, but also I learn something about each point of view. It makes it better. Like if it's in first person, I'm somewhat limited in what I can learn, and then when I write in third person, I learn new stuff. Mm -hmm. um, there are many factors that go into what I ultimately choose. Um, for Southernmost, this whole book, for most of its life, was in first person, and it alternated long sections of it were in Asher's point of view, and then long sections were in his little boy, Justin's point of view, first person. But I felt like because of the issue at hand, that it worked better third person. Because in first person, some of that stuff um, felt, it just felt a little too expository, like he was explaining to the reader, you know, some of the, some of the issue-driven stuff. So it had to be a third person. It does, you do lose some of your vernacular because it can only really show up for the most part in the dialogue. But you notice, even in that little scene I read, I'm still using proper English that is also vernacular. Like at one point it says it was fixing to be dark. Well, that's perfectly proper English, but most Americans don't say that. Southerners would be more apt to say that, you know. So I, I do manage to get the, the vernacular in, in some ways. I, in fact, in that section I read too, it says Asher Reckoned. I was in Asheville, North Carolina, and a bookseller came up to me and she said, I don't like that you have the word reckon in your book. It makes him sound too, too dumb and country. I'm like, that's a real word. <laughs> <laughs> that every 
everybody should use because it's a great word. And when British people use Rick, and it sounds elegant and hoity-toity, when I use it, I sound like a bumpkin. That really burns me up. Do we have time for a couple more? Uh, I want to thank you for using the word um, open when you were referring to um, Key West and the, um, the theme of water and flowing and the Cumberland. Um, for me, the book um, started out quietly, more very introspective and stayed kind of quiet and uh, as he takes his son south, it felt like uh, a flowing, a flowing southward, and um, it felt that that's where things opened up. Um, and then as things take a turn, um, the plot takes a turn, and um, he returns uh, north. Um, it, seems to narrow again, but then at the end there are more tributaries, unknown um, uh, destinations, unknown um, ways that it could flow. And uh, for me, um, the, just the theme of water and flowing and uh, rhythm um, was, uh, was very moving, not oh, all intended. So thank you for that. And thank you for the um, for the poem, I had to research the sandpiper, and ah, it was really love beautiful. Poem. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. You're you're a uh, very insightful reader. I appreciate that. Is there somebody else? I think else? we have time for one more. Thank you. Um, you spoke some about the different spectrums of belief that your characters represent throughout the book. And I wondered if you could talk about whether you have an idea of the belief that you want to represent, or if your character originates first and how you navigate that. Because I think it relates to what you were saying about not being um, too preachy or too direct with it. Well, I said earlier that the book <clears throat> is a lot about parenthood, but really the main thing it's about is empathy. And I think those two things go hand in hand. You know, being a parent makes you, you must become more empathetic as to, to be a good parent, et cetera. Um, and so I was, I was thinking a lot about that and how everything has to come back to empathy. For me, uh, the belief system that works the best is um, to let people be, you know, and if they're not harming me or, or others, to let them be who they are and just to be good to people as much as you can and um, to take judgment out of the equation. I think um, for me it's a, a spectrum of kindness and judgment and I think so much of my childhood uh, judging others was just drilled into us and it was like a responsibility that we were not only supposed to judge others but we were supposed to call them out on that and go up and say, hey, you're going to go to hell and I'm going to let that. I'm going to save you from that by telling you the judgment I put upon you, you know? Um, so to me, that's the spectrum, it's the judgment and the kindness. I mean, I, of course, I mean, it's really hard to be totally free of judgment. That's part of who we are, but I think we can actively work to be less judgmental, you know? Um, with that said, I try to be open to everybody's belief system and points of view. And, the only time I put my hand up, you know, is when, when their beliefs are infringing upon my own rights, and, and that happens quite a lot, <laughs> um, you know. But that that's my breaking point. I don't know. Uh, does that answer that? Yeah. Yes. Are we out of time? I think so. Let's give Tyler and Beth another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.